Today's podcast is sponsored by MPB, the online pricing engine that provides the right price for any camera or lens. Get free kit pickup and get paid within days or without leaving your home. How much could you get? Find out with a free instant quote at www.mpb.com forward slash sell. Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 9th of October. And joining me tonight are podcast regulars, Ed Selly and Ian Collin. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Oh, you hello. Doing, I, I was oh. muted there. I was because <laughs> ridiculous noises were taking place off camera. So, uh... all right. Okay. Well, start as we mean to go on there. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. So, what's happening tonight? Well, um, I've been reviewing a high sense TV. Actually, I've been reviewing lots of TVs, but we're going to talk about high sense TV tonight, the U8K. It's a mini LED TV. We're going to discuss the pros and cons. And we're also going to discuss affordable TVs. What do you actually get for your money these days? Um, is it worth looking at Hisense or TCL? Are Hisense or TCL the next Samsung and LG? Uh, we're going to discuss all of that. Ed's going to report back from a hi-fi show, and it's not Bristol. Um, mm-hmm. We're going to find out a bit more about uh, that hi-fi show and find out what's been going on. Was it worthwhile and what did Ed get to see? And we're also going to have a look at the Bowers & Wilkins 606S3, so the new 600 series i am interested in this the first serious home cinema system i built was around about uh 602s and 603s back in the day when there were yellow cones um not yellow cones anymore but we're going to discuss the new 600 series um from bowers and wilkins we're also going to have the usual tv and hi-fi news uh, and so on from ian and of course we'll answer your questions tonight uh see there's uh Quite a few questions coming in. And yes, the Sony A95L is sitting behind me. It turned up today. I have literally just set it up and put it on repeat on the Spears and Munsell. So I can't tell you anything other than it weighs a little bit. Um, It's a nice design. It's well built. That's about as much as I can tell you at the minute. Oh, and it's got a new menu system. So Mm -hmm. uh, the way the menus are displayed is slightly different. So yeah, anyway, uh, that's all coming up tonight that's all for later of course the chat window is open so if you are watching us live tonight on youtube uh, then get your questions in on the live chat we will try and answer those uh, as quickly as we can of course uh, we do appreciate that the vast majority of our listeners out there do listen to us later in the week um, on the catch up so uh, thank you very much for that it is appreciated and if you have your questions then head over to avforums.com and i got the forum list Right at the bottom of the forum list, you'll see the podcast forum. If you head in there, uh, find this podcast, and then you can leave a question in there, and uh, we will uh, come around and answer your questions if you leave them in there or your feedback, and we're going to get around to doing that um, just in a second. So I think we're we're all caught up on what we need to do tonight. So let's look at that feedback that we had uh, last time around. Um, so we touched on the thorny subject, Ed, of objective versus subjective reviews. Um, we didn't sit on the fence uh we told you what our opinions were i I Mm. give you an idea of what our editorial stance is uh, when it comes to objective versus subjective there's room for both um and i think anybody that says otherwise is kind of you know cheating themselves out of out of a, a job basically because tv reviews we do objective measurements but a lot of that stuff and i've just mentioned it there can be subjective. What's the design like? Everybody has different opinions on design. Mm. What's the build quality like? People have different opinions on materials that are used and so on. So it's not just about measurements, although measurements can be important. And when it comes to TVs, all TVs should measure the same. Um, That is basically what a standard is. That's why it exists. And those TVs should be able to measure. So we covered all that. And then Ed went into the subjective side. And of course, you can aim to have flat response from a speaker, Ed. Yes, um, you can aim to have a flat response from an amplifier. Does it mean it sounds good? Well, I mean, I think this is this is where you have the measurement side, and you can measure things, and sometimes you don't even hear what is being measured by uh, some of the measurements out there. So, what do you think in terms of the feedback, and what kind of feedback have we had, Ed? Uh, largely speaking, um, things went pretty much as anticipated. <laughs> um, uh, effectively, no. It, it, there's there's perfectly valid points raised. Um, I think where there's always going to be a degree of, um, com- uh, if you like, ambiguity, and where two sides will never meet completely, um, is it. There are there are a couple of things, and I'd, actually, we tend not to, to to get near them in a review sense, subjective or otherwise, on AV forms. There are a number of things that objectively 
when measured, do not measure well at all. And more often than not, they perform poorly in all regards. Um, when I talk about things doing specific or having specific foibles in measurement in order to chase another aspect of performance, this is perhaps unique to two channel over and above uh, anything that video or indeed multi-channel audio is seeking to do. Um, so you get something like an Eclipse loudspeaker, it's got a number of things objectively wrong with it when you measure it, but then because it doesn't have a crossover, it does certain aspects of its measurement extraordinarily well. Um, and if the resulting performance is up your alley because it scratches particular itches in terms of what you're hoping for in terms of sonic performance, you should overlook the flaws in its measurement, the fact that it has catastrophically rolled off frequency extremes, both high and low. Um, it's relatively difficult to drive and yet won't support very much power going into it. But, but, but if it hits the spots that you're actually looking for uh, in terms of the, 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 you know, the, the, the brain triggers for what is a satisfying audio performance, you shouldn't rule it out. And this is where, um, you know, as I say, there's an element of an element of grey area which perhaps isn't present in the other other parts of reviewing that we do. Um, this being said, um, actually, most of it was comparatively comparatively civilized. No, very few people accused anybody else of being either thick or wrong. So, I mean, I think that went reasonably well. Um, AV Forums member Grunviz said, I'm always on the lookout for objective reviews, which I then try and marry with a reviewer I trust, and if possible, a home demo. Three-pronged approach. I'm hopeful that my gear will measure well and have the functionality I need. This is exactly what you should be doing. And I think I this, is, this is a very important point that's raised as well. I mean, uh, reviews are there to guide you and tell you what we think is important information. But at the end of the day, you don't base your purchase on just one review. Um, you know, things that I buy uh, and I maybe don't know the subject matter too well, I'll do my research. And I think most people do, Ed. Um, yes. That means reading reviews. It means looking at YouTube videos. And ultimately, you go and you have a bit of a play with the product as well, if you can. So um, it's not just one factor. So hopefully we're an important uh, factor for people. That You know, they do come and visit us and read what we uh, have to say and the things that we point out but at the end of the day it, it should never just be based on that no um and i mean for as i say I, I said in the piece the last podcast that we did um if you dislike the subjective opinion on how something sounds that's absolutely fine my counter would be that um the part of the review that leads up to the how we test um, that's probably will contain things that will be of more than the passing interest to you. I mean, the classic example for this is Grado headphones. Grado has made some of the best sounding headphones at their respective price points for God, most, most of this century and, and a little bit before. Um, but some of them are incredibly uncomfortable. I mean, I, I think I actually have to be, be relatively blunt about this. They've got better recently but I still wouldn't describe them as cosseting. And it really doesn't matter how well they measure, and they do tend to measure extremely well. And they're actually relatively well made, and, and or they do all sorts of other things. But you have to, have to, have to, have to try them on and listen to them as long as you can, because a number of people, myself included, simply can't stand to wear them for an extended length of time. Uh, I need to stress, in the interest of fairness and balance, that more recent Grado designs that I've tested have gone a long way to overcoming this, but it was more of a historical thing. But nevertheless, stuff like that, yes, if you're buying these things sight unseen, you will be prepared for all manner of unpleasant surprises, no matter how well the product measures or performs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, did we mention Toonami? No, uh, he, uh, he is a regular. So. Regular to, uh, contributor to Toonami stated, ultimately, the final listening experience counts for me. I don't need a data sheet for that. No, that's fair enough. Um, ultimately, you aren't, uh, well, I'm sure potentially somebody listening is, but for the most part, you aren't mastering. You aren't um, uh, seeking some sort of uh, exact truth behind something. You are um seeking to listen to music in as enjoyable a method as you can muster with the equipment available to you and first and foremost the piece of equipment must mm. do that so yeah um <laughs> the both both people i mean I, in, in an absolute sense both of those contributors are on opposite sides of the debate but it comes down to get you know read as much or as little as a review as you like but get hands on with it and make mm. sure that it actually delivers what it needs to for you yeah, absolutely. Right. So we're going to move on. But if you do have feedback uh, for us or any comments on tonight's show, uh, some of the subjects that we cover, and we are going to cover um, 
you know, some in-depth stuff with Hisense and TCL, the new, the new Samsung LG. What's your thoughts on that? Get them all in tonight. Um, right. I'm going to move on before we get on with the show. We've got current competition. So, Ian, why don't you tell us all about them? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've got some good hardware competitions currently open to AV Forums members. Uh, with the total prize pool, I think three and a half thousand pounds. So it sounds like it's worth getting involved in. Mm. Uh, first up, we partnered with AV.com, so you can win a complete monitor audio and rock sound hi fi system worth two thousand four hundred and sixty eight pounds. Uh, this includes a pair of monitor audio bronze 500 floor standing speakers, uh, a rock sound and tesser integrated amplifier, and a visual cable pack. Uh, that competition is open until the closing minutes of Thursday, the 19th of October. Uh, as is our competition to uh, win some Bowers and Wilkins 607 S3 bookshelf speakers with an AudioQuest Rocket 11 speaker cable, courtesy of Peter Tyson, which is worth a combined total of £919. So there's a couple of uh, very big uh, competitions worth getting your names in the hat for. Uh, we've also got a bunch of discs uh, open to all the AV Forums members as well. Uh, all on DVD or Blu-ray, including the likes of The Chelsea Detective Season 1, Season 22 of Midsummer Murders. They made a lot of those. Uh, Broken Wood Mystery Season 9, uh, it's the complete series of Succession. You can get uh, Stephen King on screen, documentaries on a Blu-ray, uh, a couple of horror films, courtesy of Scream and Scream Again and The Dead Mother, both on limited edition Blu-ray from Radiance Films. Uh, and also there's a whole bunch of exclusive offers for patrons. Uh, most of these are on uh, 4K Ultra HD or Blu-ray. You can get uh, It Follows, Cutthroat Island, uh, U571, Asteroid City, The Flash, Marlow, and the Creep Social Series 1, 2, and 3, uh, as well as a bunch of our uh, top 10 recommended Blu-rays for September. Uh, to get access to any and all of those, head over to avforums.com slash competitions. And as mentioned, it's open to all eligible AV Forums members, uh, except for the ones where you need to be a patron. Uh, who's resident in the UK? What uh, we got? Um, do you want me to do the previous winners as well? No, that's my job. Go oh, away. I know that's Ed's job. Oh, yeah. no, step on his toes. no, absolutely. Step back, right? Okay, obviously, you know, just to point out that people do win these things, so we do have previous hardware competition winners. R21442 uh won a valencia tuscany black cinema seat well worth 1400 boys dj dunk won 500 pounds to spend with mpb conrad uh won a special edition nodex wireless high-res multi-room streamer for worth uh 700 pounds uh, uh all of which are pretty spunky prizes so you know it could be you you know old lottery thing um New supporters, Greg Andrews uh, bought us a coffee uh, at buymeacoffee.com forward slash AV forums. Thank you, Greg. And we have a new patron, uh, which is uh, Captain Eyecatch. So uh, thank you for joining. Yep. And thank you for the support, guys. It's always grateful. Um, we uh, we have we'll, we'll have more to talk about in terms of uh, where podcasts are going and some of the feedback we received uh, towards the end of the year. So yep, uh, the absolutely. pursuit of the perfect or at least less risible podcast <laughs> continues apace. So we'll see what it we does indeed. There. Right. Okay. So I think we're we're caught up with housekeeping. Uh, we'll get on the, with the show next. Okay, so let's go to TV news uh, before we get stuck into a TV review. So, Ian, uh, what's happening in the world of TV at the minute? A little bit quiet at the minute because we're getting up to CES time at the end of the year, but there's still some news out there. Uh, yeah, yeah, this comes courtesy of JVC and might fit in quite nicely with the sort of the budget slash affordable uh, topic coming up a little bit later. But yeah, JVC is the latest company to collaborate with Roku uh, to offer up some uh, cheap and cheerful smaller size TVs. Um, it's announced four new models with a 24 inch uh, and a 32 inch HD version, along with a 40 and a 43 inch full HD option. Obviously, the hook being that they all use the Roku TV operating system. Uh, all models, 60 hertz direct lit LEDs. Prices range from £169 for that 24 inch up to £329 for the larger 43 inch, uh, with Curry's being JVC's online store of choice in the UK if you wanted to shop online. And as a quick side note to that, Rocco also announced that any and all uh, customers uh, who use their kit uh, got a chance to give ITVX Premium a 30-day trial if you feel like giving that a whirl and watching it ad-free for 30 days. Yep, I think most manufacturers, uh, certainly that area of the market, have a Roku TV nowadays. Uh, it seems to be the thing to have. So, yeah, 
JVC getting on board with that. So as Ian alluded to, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, more of the affordable end of the market, although um, things do change quite quickly at that end of the market. Um, so two brands that we are going to discuss are Hisense and TCL, uh, both Chinese manufacturers. Uh, Hisense been around um, or probably a little bit better known to AV Forums members in the UK because they've been around a little while. They've done some big sponsorship deals with the likes of the Euro finals um, and a few other football tournaments, including the World Cup. Um, TCL are on a big promotional push at the minute. They are pushing their TVs forward and uh, they've just done a huge deal with the, the NFL uh, in the States to push their brand, um, obviously taking a leaf out of High Sense's book in terms of trying to get their brand well known. Um, TCL been around a long time. Uh, if you are familiar with our CES coverage going back to um, 2008, 2009, um, we've covered TCL. Uh, they were a small brand back then, and obviously uh, they're now world number two in terms of uh, uh, TV producer, manufacturer. So a uh, huge company now. But we're going to talk about very quickly the High Sense U8K, which I reviewed recently. Um, Kraken TV, uh, this is where we're starting to see things change a little bit for these manufacturers because they are taking this quite seriously now. They've done the the whole undercutting and disruptive side of their businesses in terms of uh, being market disruptive, getting their name known, doing big sponsorship deals. Now they have to produce the goods. This is where uh, the quality side of things starts to creep in and the U8K is certainly uh, aimed as a flagship TV. It's a little bit more expensive than you have paid for a, a TV in the past from this brand. So around about £1,600 for the 65-inch TV that I reviewed. Um, so what do you get for your money? Well, you get quite a bit, actually. And this is um, one thing that Hisense have always done well is in terms of build quality. So we mentioned a little bit earlier on how important that is. Uh, Hisense have always felt like a, a a good product, uh, an exp more expensive product than it actually is. Although, like I say, we're now starting to creep up in terms of price uh, and what you're getting for your money. 1,700 plus nets of peak brightness, which sounds really good. And uh, TCL C845 that I reviewed recently, it did 2,000 nets peak. Um, the problem is that these are mini LED TVs, so they use a local dimming algorithm. And the one thing that they have to do with the local dimming is stop what's called blooming. So blooming is basically if you have a bright object, say a bit of white text on a screen with a dark background or a black background. So say subtitles. Um, blooming is is the light that you see around the edges of those letters. So it looks like that it, it's more or less blooming, as the name suggests. That the light is 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 too far away. If you see the same thing. On an OLED TV, there would be a sharp line uh, around the text because you've got pixel to pixel on, on an OLED. Whereas with a mini LED TV, you have zones, uh, you have so many uh, pixels in those zones and you can't switch it off one for one. So you're always going to have some overspill into other areas. So what they do is they use a, a uh, a blooming suppression built into the algorithm, which means that anything that's small and bright tends to get dimmed down. Um, the whole point of HDR is that you get small bright areas that give you that dynamic range. So what it's actually doing is it's dimming down in Samsung. I do this a lot more aggressively with their local dimming. Um, you're dimming down your specular highlight detail. You're dimming down these small areas that should really stand out. And what that does is it affects your overall dynamic range. So the, the problem here with the high sense is that it measures 25% window. So 25% of the screen, if you turn that bright white, it measures more in terms of peak brightness than it does for the industry standard 10%. Normally what you'd see is 10% being, the, uh, or actually you'd probably see 3%, 5% and 10% measuring round about the same, or they certainly should. And then you see a slight drop off towards the, uh, the full screen brightness in normal cases. What you see with these TVs is that the smaller boxes, so the 3%, 5% is less then the 25%. 25% is almost 2,000 nits on this TV. The 10% is 1,700 nits. So what that points to is it's too bright overall and it's not giving you the small areas of the screen and the peak brightness that you should be getting. So what that then translates to is actually poor HDR tone mapping on this uh, high sense, which means that it over brightens the image and it starts to clip detail. So the scene that I use all the time in our video reviews and the video review for this high sense will be going out tomorrow uh, tomorrow afternoon on YouTube. Um, and I've used the example of the horses in the snow. And if you look at that, you know, 600 nits, all the details there, 
1,000 nets, some of it's starting to disappear. Anything 2,000 nets and over, what you're tending to see is that all that detail disappears, which points to not very good mapping to the standards, but also, um, you know, this TV is just too bright and, and you're losing that dynamic range using the contrast. But it's 1,600 quid. So what do you get for your money? Well, you're getting every single HDR format here. So HDR10, HDR10+, plus HLG, Dolby Vision, Dolby Vision IQ, it does the lot. Um, so you're getting value there. In terms of gaming, it's also got uh, some really good gaming credentials. So you get two HDMI 2.1 inputs at 48 gigabits per second, so full bandwidth uh, in there. Um, you've also got stuff like VRR and so on. You've got a games uh, menu, which pops up on screen, and that gives you stuff like uh, your frame rate. So it will do uh, 4K 120 hertz. It will also do that with Dolby Vision. And this points to the chipset that it's using. So this is using the new Pentonic uh, chipset, 700 chipset from uh, MediaTek, um, which means that we do get Dolby Vision gaming at 120 4K. Um, and this little game menu is fantastic. It pops up. It tells you everything you need to know, your frames per second, your HDR, do you have VRR on and off? Uh, you know, um, there are areas like dark detail, which is like a gamma uh, cheat. So you can go in there and you can adjust the gamma so you can see into the shadows. So you can see if somebody's hiding in there and shooting at you in your games and so on. Uh, you can change your aspect ratio, screen position, all that kind of thing, plus free sync and VR. It's all there, um, and it, it does really well. In terms of uh, input lag as well, uh, really quite responsive, so 13.2 milliseconds for 4K60, and then between 5.2 and 5.6 for uh, 120 hertz gaming. So, um, And it will, with a gaming PC, do 144 hertz on those two HDMI inputs as well. So uh, if you've got a... a, a, a high-end gaming PC with a good graphics card in there that you can set your refresh rate and frame rate, um, then you should be able to get 144 out of this as well. So as a gaming TV, it stacks up really well. And let's face it, uh, people in the market for this level of TV, you're going to watch it in a room like this room behind me. Uh, normally I switch all the lights off, but as you can see, it's it's a normal room with normal ambient lighting and so on. That's where you're going to watch this TV. And to be honest with you, it does a really good job. Out of the box, it wasn't quite as accurate in filmmaker mode as I would like it to be. Um, I need high sense to have a look at that and, and tinker with it in the will. Um, but once calibrated, it's absolutely spot on. You have your foibles with this technology. So again, viewing angles with a VA panel, it looks a little bit washed out the more off axis you get, around about 30% onwards, it does wash out quite a bit and you get a bit of a gamma shift. So the image can start to look a little bit cloudy. Black levels are a little bit raised on this TV. Um, it seems to me that the uh, the definitely the, the algorithm isn't quite pushing the black levels and it's probably doing that to combat any black crush. So that's details being crushed by the blacks. Um, it's trying to avoid that, but at, at, at the expense of lifting uh, the black floor very slightly as well. So that is noticeable with scope film. So 235 to 1 films of black bars top and bottom. They're not inky black. Um, but again, you know, if you're watching in a room with ambient light, you're probably not going to see little issues uh, like that. So overall, it's good value for money. Is it good as good as an OLED for watching movies? No. But this TV is not designed for that end of the market. Uh, this TV is designed for maximum real estate, uh, screen real estate for minimum outlay, with all the, the the HDR formats on there, um, it does a very good job of HDR. Not fantastic, but it does a very good job. Um, very uh, much uh, not middle of the road, but this is kind of what uh, the market is that, that high sensor aiming the TV at. In terms of motion and so on, it does that very well. Five five pull downs down right. There is a little bit of dirty screen effect. Um, so what is dirty screen effect? It's basically caused by the backlight. Um, and you being able to see basically patches um, on the screen, um, which is a common trait with uh, LED TVs, uh, especially many LED TVs. Uh, you can see the makeup of the panel with some, if you put a 50% brightness pattern up, you'll see blotchiness. That blotchiness, if you're watching a football with a green pitch and the camera starts moving, you then start to see these blotches being quite aggressive and that's what we mean by dirty screen effect it looks like the screen's dirty because the the way that the camera is moving you see these blotches or, or, or clouding so um it does do that um and on certain materials certain uh, viewing presets you will see that but overall you're getting a lot for your money uh, with the high sense and you're getting even more money um 
with TCL. So uh, again, these are two brands that are really pushing. Um, and we saw this, said quite a number of years ago. You've been around just as long as I have in this industry. Um, it used to be the Japanese manufacturers, so your Sharps, your Sonys, your Panasonics, um, who dominated the market when it came yeah. to TVs. And year on year, the entries from the South Korean brands got better and better yeah. and yeah. better until the point where actually uh they they were the they were the movers and shakers um uh, i mean i don't uh, i don't know enough about the chinese companies to 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 want to place a bet on whether this is going to happen again but again the trend that you've just been describing is that they just they you know they generally speaking take the feedback on models um and the the path is continuous and, and upward I, I don't know whether it's a perception thing and i don't know if it's a fair apples and oranges style compa uh, comparison because the point where uh the south korean brands were improving dramatically was one of relatively stable technology um and i don't know whether just sort of ongoing shifts in certain aspects means that it's a harder job it does feel like the the progression and improvement rate is slightly slower this time around and, and I think the reason for that, Ed, is is the fact that you've got HDR, you've got this new, um, you know, display technology, which Samsung and, and uh, LG certainly didn't have to contend with when they were mm. coming through. Oh no, absolutely. Um, and you know, the early days of OLED, and so nobody foresaw HDR being a thing. So, you know, that technology has had to catch up, as it were, and, and yeah. it saw the depth. Uh, the death of plasma as well around about the same time because it couldn't move up to 4k without huge expense and yes. of course power consumption at that point um had to be addressed as well so they do have a tougher battle on their hands um but what are all the points of contact like on this i mean what's uh, how does the very, remote feel very uh, good i mean the remote is better than uh, the lg at the minute so you spend three and a half grand on an lg you're getting a plastic black remote control yeah. uh the high sense it's a lovely metal, mm, it's not um, a bad metal face thing. remote um fits nice in the hand and so on so you know they they are paying attention to this the, the build quality has always been good on the high sense tcl a little bit more plastic but where it matters what you see from your seating position mm. it looks good it looks a lot a little bit more expensive than than you're actually spending so yeah they've got a tougher fight in terms of um the technology that's out there and technology changing and gaming being a lot more advanced so on but both of them are coming to the to the table with some really good um mid level TVs that are uh, doing very well. High Sense are looking at the UX TV. Um, we're still not sure if we're going to get that in the UK. This was a big TV at CES. Um, if you want to see it, go and have a look at our CES coverage from earlier in the year. Um, but this is like their big premium TV that, that they are pushing forward as, as being their flagship. So they are pushing that forward. They're pushing laser TV as well, which was projector based, so ultra short throw projector based. So High Sense have been making a lot of noise over the last few years and certainly gaining traction. TCL are definitely the more aggressive party, um, and they are coming in with aggressive marketing. They're coming in with bigger budgets. They're coming in with um, some would say better technology, or they're certainly listening. Um, and implementing a lot quicker than Hisense. I've got to say Hisense have been great um, because I, I I gave them, I think it was six out of 10 last year, and I gave them some feedback issues. They got straight in touch. Um, now, I've, I've given bad reviews to companies like Samsung and then been blacklisted and, mm -hmm. and, and not, you know, uh, not being invited to things because, because of what we've said in reviews. Whereas, you know, the complete flip of the coin was Hisense actually came and said, look, we want to make a better product. We're taking on your feedback. What else do you think we need to be adding in? And and taking that feedback on board and coming back the next year with a much better product. And you know, getting us involved in terms of can you guys uh, test this and be as brutal as you like, but give us the honest feedback. So it's great when companies do that. TCL have been the same. You know, um, they they have people on board. Both of these companies um, they actually take on board what's being said, and the engineers are interested and so on. So again, that bodes well in terms of where these companies are going. Will they replace Samsung and LG? I don't know, is is the big question. Um, I think there's quite a level of dominance from LG and Samsung in terms of where they are with technology, like um, 
uh, micro LED with Samsung. Although to be fair, TCL are, are very, very strong in that department. Uh, TCL also doing inkjet uh, OLED technology, which I reported on from CES, which uh, is probably still a few years away. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's a promising technology and, and it could really slash the price um, of, uh, of OLED and give you a true RGB image as well. So that's something to watch. So both these companies are doing R&D. They're both looking at the market. They're both being quite aggressive. TCL being really aggressive at the minute in terms of their marketing. So who knows? Um, what do you guys think out there? Uh, you know, you guys go and spend your money on the TVs. Um, it's fair enough us reviewing the product and, and giving you an insight. But at the end of the day, you're going and spending your hard end. Um, is Hisense TCL, are these brands that you're interested in if you're a, uh, an enthusiast? Or if you're, you're more of a general tech consumer, um, does this appeal to you? You know, um, you know. I think the TCL is 65 inches, about £1,050. This high sense is uh, £1,600. So, you know, you're you're talking about quite a gap between the two manufacturers. Would that push you towards uh, TCL um, because of the price, because of the technology? Have you seen it? Have you gone and had a look at these TVs? Let us know. Tell us in the, uh, in the comments if you're watching live or uh, put it on the podcast forum uh, underneath this podcast let us know your thoughts on where you think um both these manufacturers are heading what do you think of the products do you own the products i've actually been living with a tcl for about four days now five days is on main tv so saturday night viewing we sat and watched strictly on it um we watched uh, a few other bits and pieces tomorrow night we'll watch bake off with our cakes um uh, so how did it stack up to be honest with you with normal tv in a normal living room and so a very, very good, very good TV. And I think that's 650 quid for this 745 that I'm using at the minute, which is in for review. So yeah, you get a lot for your money and you know the picture quality does stand up quite well. So what's your thoughts? Let us know. Um, right, so we need to move on slightly. Uh, what have I got coming up for review? Well, like I say, TCLC 745 is in the living room at the moment, so I'm busy working on that one. This big one behind me, although it doesn't look that big on, on the screen here, but that is the new Sony, the A95L, their flagship. Uh, we appear to have lost Phil in all of the excitement there. Um, he's got lots and lots of amazing things turning up, so as soon as we get him back, we'll, uh, we'll work it out from there. But... Um, I've no. got the LG G3 oh, sitting next to me here, and um, to this side. Oh, did I yeah, disappear? Yeah, there? you disappeared. So I just, just, oh, right. you know, but no, I don't know what's going okay. on there. But no. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm looking at the feed over here now, and I can see that I'm frozen back then. <laughs> uh, Time slip. Yeah. Yeah. So where did you get to? What did What did you? You, uh, you literally were about to launch into what you've got coming up, and oh, then okay. you came back at what you finished with what you've got. Coming right, up. Okay. A ninety five L. Yeah, so very quickly, the TCL is in the living room. It's getting reviewed. Uh, the A95L is being fast-tracked. It arrived today. I couldn't tell you anything about it other than it's been built nicely. It weighs a ton. It's on the stand. It's running some footage at the minute. I'm going to get stuck into that this week. I've got the G3 sitting next to me, uh, the LG G3. I've also got the Samsung. You can just about see it sitting on the floor over here. Uh, we're going to do comparisons with those. I've got Philips' new 908 turning up on Thursday. Uh, you can guarantee that that's going to sit next to this uh, Sony as well for some comparison. So uh, I'm finishing off TV season with a, with a big hurrah. We're going to get all the screens, or certainly the majority of the big screens together here uh, as part of the comparison for this Sony review. Um, so stick around for that. I'm fast-tracking that through. Hopefully we might have something in the next week um, with videos to follow after that. Um, so yeah, and... Of course, I've still got the two Panasonics that I mentioned last time around. So the MZ1500, MX950, uh, they will get done as well because we've got our Editor's Choice Awards coming up at the end uh, of October into November. So everything needs to kind of be finished by then. So you mm. can guarantee that these reviews are coming through and going to come through thick and fast. So I think we've caught up with everything TV-wise. And like I say, any questions, get them in there. And I'm just going to quickly check before we go. Oh, yes. Uh, Michael Walker says, I've got a high sense 65 inch in the guest bedroom. It works very well, but I still prefer my Sony Z9D in the basement and master bedroom. Yep. Yeah, obviously, if you uh, want something that is uh, a bit more suited to critical movie viewing, absolutely the Sony. But as an everyday TV, something for the living room, 65 inches. And these latest TVs from Hisense and TCL really are, you know, they're pushing the bigger brands now. 
and in terms of quality, and they're definitely worth looking at. So thanks for your comments, Michael. He also said, did you hear the Nakamishi Dragon? It's, yes, I certainly did. Um, it's really unfortunate that it's not coming to the UK and that I can't get my hands on it because I am desperate uh, to spend some time with it. It was a cracking uh, piece of kit. I had the full demo with the CEO. There's also a video on our channel um, from CES where we go into quite some detail over the Nakamishi. So go and have a look at that video. Um, and then Terrible User says, I thought Hisense and TCL had Android TV. Now, uh, not in the UK. So in the UK, uh, it is Google TV um, on the TCL. And on the Hisense, they use Vida, which is their smart TV system. Now, if you go and get the U8K in the US, it is a different setup. It uses Google TV and it doesn't have the sound bar um, that the U8K in the UK has. So in terms of the panel, it's the same panel, it's the same amount of dimming zones, it's the same processor, it's the same local dimming algorithm. Chassis design is different between the US and UK, and the smart system is different. It's Google in the US and uh, Vida uh, U7 in the UK. So hopefully that uh, gives you the answer to that one terrible username. And yeah, I think we're, we're all up to date on the question. So that's TV finished with. We'll be back in a second with Hi-Fi. If you enjoy the podcast on YouTube, then please like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, then please leave us a rating on your podcast app. We invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast at avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at avforums. Right then, uh, spot a hi-fi. Um, uh, thank you, Phil, for uh, all the TV things. Uh, right, uh, I, in a bit, I'm going to talk about the um, Bose and Wilkins 606 S3 and the um, uh, UK Hi-Fi Show Live. But first of all, we've got a few news stories. Now, we've got multiple news stories that we're going to do quickly. Um, uh, so first up, in we've got some new products from Affordable Heroes Tangent. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Um, yeah, following on from the talk about cheap and affordable TVs. Uh, launched a couple of low-price audio pulse courtesy of the DAC2 or DAC2 uh, and the Amster TV2 as well. Uh, as you might expect, the DAC2 lives up to its name. Uh, we did say that ES90232 24-bit stereo DAC uh, with Aptex HD Bluetooth. Uh, it can work as a preamplifier or a dedicated headphone amp, and that sells at £249. Uh, and again, as you might have guessed, the Amster TV2 amp uh, is designed to be used with TVs. It comes with two channels of 50 watts application apiece, uh, and that is currently retailing for £199. So in line with the TVs, can good things come in small and affordable packages such as what Tangent are doing here? Well, they've certainly done pretty well so far. Um, and uh, the Tangent products that we've looked at have been really, really quite impressive value for money. We will be getting these in in the fullness of time. So uh, we'll find out for ourselves. But yeah, the Omens are pretty good. Um, at the slightly less affordable and more surprising end of things, uh, we also have a new turntable from Cyrus. Yeah, so Cyrus Audio has announced uh, its first ever turntable, um, known rather unoriginally as the TT turntable. Um, obviously, they spent a lot more money on the technology because um, these guys aren't uh, exactly aiming, they're not exactly dipping their toe in the water. Uh, with the TT turntable coming with a price tag of £4,295. Uh, obviously, it's designed to work in harmony with their high-end amps and preamps. Um, so I mean, are, are, are people expecting big and bright things from this? Because uh, it could be a very decent piece of kit indeed. Well, um, I'm sort of bound by what I can't and can and can't say on this because I've actually had the review sample uh, here for a period of time. Um, uh, it, it... I need to be clear. It was they. The, the agreement was made, regardless of of my input as to who the review was for. It is not AV Forum, so I'm limited as what I can say because it's going somewhere else, and they do really want the exclusive on it. Um, uh, nevertheless, it's an interesting bit of kit because it's not simply somebody else's turntable uh, with their badge on it. It has got another turntable manufacturer's uh, input. Actually, it has two different turntable manufacturers' input in it, just to be um, slightly peculiar. But um, the one thing that I, it, the photos do not convey is quite how much this thing weighs. It's about 25 kilos um, once it's out of the box and sat there. It um, It's a very dense thing indeed, um, and uh, that has some... Uh, impact on uh, its resistance to the outside world and other things it's not just a me too product i believe that cyrus is relatively realistic about 
uh, exactly how many of them they're going to sell. But nevertheless, it's an interesting bit of kit and it's not simply a, a sort of cynical badging exercise. So uh, we'll see if they change their mind as to what sort of coverage they want. But for the moment, uh, that is uh, being being has been done for another publication. So my apologies on that. But uh, no, I can tell you it, it's, it's an interesting bit of kit. Um, just reload my thing. Uh, and then, uh, actually, in the semi-affordable things, we've got some new Arcams as well, haven't we? Yeah, Arcam uh, has announced another new range uh, of products for its lineup, this time known as the Radia series, or Radia series, depending on uh, your point of view. Uh, it's made up of five new models, uh, the A5, the A15, and the A25 integrated amplifiers. It's also a CD5 CD player and an ST5 high-resolution streamer. Uh, aside from the specs and all the finer details, all of which are up on the website if you want to take a closer look, uh, it's a bit of a new look to them as well. They've actually dared to add a little splash of colour to the otherwise you know, plain black cases of old, giving it a bit of a new look. And they've also got a bit of a new kind of design philosophy that they're trying to embrace as well. Uh, yes. In terms of the pricings, uh, the amps start at £749, going up to £1,499. CD players at £699 and the ST5 streamers at £799. And they're all due to, to launch later this month. So do, do we like the look? Well, I went along to the launch and I'm much more enamoured with how they look, having seen them for real. Um, I think I think it is the job of Arcam to not just make identical black boxes to everyone else. They have to do something slightly different. I think they've done a neat job of differentiating themselves from other people with these. Um, I couldn't draw too many conclusions about the performance. There was a demonstration, but it was um, it was in suboptimal circumstances. But you know, there's there's seemingly quite a bit to like. Um, internally, they're not a massive. They they you know they they are revised versions of what went before. There are there are detailed alterations, but fundamentally, Arcam has a design philosophy that they're quite happy with. Um, so this is as much a refit of how they sit in 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 the hi-fi world, so to speak. But no, I'm quite taken with the appearance of them um i'm glad you and, said that because i've looked at the the photos um yeah. and the publicity photos don't do them any favors whatsoever no it's um, it, I, I, but i know you know i'm realistic enough to know that actually i'll wait till i see one in in the flesh as it were before i, I make any judgment call but yeah the, in the photos they don't really look no, I, I I think it's one of those things. The one thing I will say is that um, Arkham's philosophy in this uh, has it, it, what generally happens is the products don't date terribly well. I think this is very of the moment. It may not look quite so swish in you know ten years time, but that's not how that's not necessarily a major uh, sales concern. Um, something else that's cropped up in the comments threads and has been asked. Um, people are asking, is there going to be a replacement for the SA30, um, which was a much more sophisticated thing, it had Dirac and streaming on board and so on and so forth. I'm bound by what I can and can't say, but it, it's probably useful enough for me to say that this is the first batch of radio products. There will be more, so make of that what you will. This is not all there's going to be. Um, and then uh, the incredibly productive Wharfdale uh, have also got some new speakers out, haven't they, Ian? Uh, yeah, six new models been announced by Wharfdale, making up uh, the new Aura family. Uh, you get the Aura 1 and 2, which is your bookshelf or stand mount options, the Aura 3 and 4, two floor standards, and there's also two centre channels, the C and the CS. Uh, all of these products borrow heavily from the company's Elysian range, but come in a rather more compact and thankfully more affordable uh, packages. Uh, prices starting from £1,099 for the cheapest of the two centres, going up to £3,999 for a pair of the Aura 4 floor standards. So sort of, well, hopefully high-end tech in a slightly more affordable package. Yes, um, I've been a bit adrift of Wharfdale. Uh, that's as much because there are limits to just how much stuff we can cover. But um, they're doing some interesting things, and it, it really is forming its sort of own identity within the IAG lineup. Uh, I mean, and doing some interesting things, like you know, that, that whacking great sort of stand mount shape um is it's an acquired taste but it you know it does allow for excellent performance in, in you know potentially so um we will uh try and select a super model to have a look at and um yeah it's i mean it's this and and the dovedale and other things that you could as a dealer basically uh, tick a lot of boxes by taking wharfdale on by the fact that they make a lot of boxes so we'll see how um this all stacks up and whether they are as good as they are promised and lastly a rather different parallel speakers has been announced from Sonus Faber. 
Yeah, this is a, more of a, a one-stop audio solution from Thomas Faber, who've announced its first active wireless stereo loudspeaker system, which is known as the Duetto. Uh, it's comprised of two bookshelf speakers, uh, due to launch in November, priced at £3,499, uh, with the stands costing an extra £649 if you wanted to mount them. Uh, speakers include a 100-watt Class B amp for the tweeter, 250-watt Class D model for the mid-bass drive unit, uh, and needs a similar Senso control system that we'd seen on the Omnia that came out last year. And um, we saw pretty good things from the Omnia, so are we hoping or expecting the same thing here? Well, we've got a set turning up, so we'll find out for real. Um, but no, it's a very interesting product and it's, uh, uh, you know, objectively, it looks like a very clever, a clever way of getting people invested in the Sonus Faber aesthetic whilst giving them a thoroughly modern set of things to do with it. So hopefully, um, if it is related to the Omnia, which is very, very capable indeed, this will be well worth looking at too, and we will find out for ourselves soon enough. So thank you for that, Ian. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, review. Uh, is the Boas 606 S3. Um, it's up on the site, so I don't want to go into absurd detail on this. Um, the main feedback from uh, people's comments on the site is that the aesthetics are very much a matter of taste on this one. I, I don't get that excited about white loudspeakers. I don't think the 606 is particularly beautiful in the white. Um, but I mean, some of the comments, no, I don't think it's an ugly speaker. And I think the um, the wood finish actually looks rather tidy. So um, let's put that to one side for a moment. Um, it's comfortably the best sounding 600 that I've listened to in, well, I mean, ignoring the fact that there were some older models, turn of the century time, which makes it sound like a very long time ago indeed, uh, where they could be tremendously entertaining, but there were some, you know, some some sort of wrinkles in the absolute quality of the performance this manages to be enormous amounts of fun whilst being technically very very accomplished indeed um george has asked in the comments thread when it comes to pairing with nam does it need more power to sing i.e 100 watts and over absolutely not no um i did some tests on the end of a blue sound power node edge and whilst there there was more to get out of them I and mean, if you bolt them onto the end of an avid accent which is four and a half thousand pounds or they're still only 70 watts they do get a lot better but no they are benign uh they have an impedance dip but it doesn't seem to be something that they stick at for very long because i couldn't get any really unhappy behavior out of them with the blue sound um and Boas has gone to great lengths to try and test the entire range with less overtly hi-fi product. And I think that that's really um, yielded dividends in, in how they behave. You can make use of these in such a way that they could be an upgraded speaker for uh, an existing sort of standalone amplifier all in one. And they'll give you a big chunk of what they do. And then if you choose to invest in better le electronics, going forward they'll they'll continue to improve from there and critically um i state this in the review but it bears repeating what they do exceptionally well is give you a, a pretty decent snapshot of what Bowers and wilkins is about in 2023 if you like what these speakers do you could put them back in the box uh, spend an extra £9,250 and get um, a pair of 805 signatures. And obviously they're dramatically better, but the basic characteristics and behaviour and what they do is is recognisably from the same company. So you get that encapsulated Bowers and Wilkins experience um, and they do that whilst being fairly entertaining because actually of late most Bowers and Wilkins speakers that I've been testing have been fairly entertaining and I don't know how you measure entertaining um no I <laughs> well, don't this is a serious thing there has to be yes. there has to be something going on in terms of how they're being designed and set up and that, but a certain there, there is a certain quality to them which simply wasn't present a couple of years previously and is now without really as best as I can work out affecting anything I would objectively say is is you know they're they're sort of you know de the respectable things we expect them to do they just seem to be more enjoyable whilst they do it and I've, I've heard this before Ed and, I, and I've heard and you know when you get as cynical as we do at, at our age and, and haven't done this for such a long time you think, yeah, yeah. How how different can it be from you know the outgoing model? And mm. you know, every everything's always better when you get a new model coming along. But in all seriousness, what you just said there from you know the six hundred series, which I haven't heard the S3s, um, 
but I did spend some time with the 700 S3s and then uh, spent some time recently with the with the 801 D4. Yeah. And, you know, the difference in price between uh, those speaker ranges is huge. I mean, the, the 801 D4 is, what, 40 grand, 32 yes. and a half, something like that. Um, and the 700 series is, is significantly less than that, maybe a few grand. But there is a signature sound. There is this, as you describe it, a, a Bowers and Wilkins um, touch that, that you know you're listening to a Bowers and Wilkins speaker, even if there's 40 grand's worth of difference between them. Uh, there is some traits that, that do hand over and, and you can pick up on. And the other thing, I, I don't know what the 600 is like, but certainly the 700 compared to the S2 to the S3, there was a big, big difference in terms of the sound stage, in terms of, you know, the sound actually, the, and it's what manufacturers always aim for is the speaker to disappear. Mm. And I thought with the S3, you got that effect. It was it was beyond that cabinet. It, it, it sounded a lot nicer than than the previous model. And again, you only get that when you do side by side. And I did side by side um, with those two. And, and it was really quite a standout uh, between the S3 and the S2. No, it, it's it's similar. The 600s have a simpler cabinet. And yeah. uh, with the noble exception to an extent of Q Acoustics, who really are, uh, who again, if you like, they, they at that price point, they go slightly short on driver sophistication to go long on cabinets. Q Acoustics at sub £1,000 price points are better at disappearing than any, anybody else. Um, but nevertheless, if you put a, a modicum of care into where you place these, they yes, they are able to drop into the stereo image that they create. And unless you really listen for them, actually spe saying they're exactly there is, is not the easiest thing in the world to do. And whatever they give away to comment, uh, comparable Q acoustic speakers, uh, I mean, it, they sit between the uh, 5020 and the um, Concept 30, depending on who you're shopping with and where. Um, it, it, the Concept 30 is, is much, much better at disappearing, but then the Bowers is significantly better in terms of bass extension. Um, and in some ways, there's there's other improvements across tonality and the behaviour of the two drivers and so on and so forth. So six or one half a dozen the other. As we were saying right at the beginning of this, you should go to a dealer and have a listen to them before yeah, you absolutely. spend your hard-earned money and decide which of them blows your frock up. So yeah, um, but the reviews on the site, I believe, Phil, you were saying that you've all you've requested multi-channel, so yeah, we're so not we're, ignoring that. We're we're hopefully going to because, like I said to you right at the beginning of the podcast, um, Bowser Milk and Six Hundred series speakers were the first um, multi big spend multi-channel um, system that I bought back in the early nineties um, when I was first uh, had a little bit of disposable and I wanted to to really up up my system at the time so it's interesting it'd be interesting to see just where we are in 2023 with the 600 series mm. and um you know what do you get now for your money in terms of performance and and you know the variations in terms of the speakers for standard stand mounts center speaker um is it a nice cohesive system and so on so our reviewer matt is hopefully going to be looking at those if we can get that arranged in the next uh, uh short while we'll yes we'll have a look um, at each other. And then finally, uh, just a quick word on the Hi-Fi Show Live. Sorry, I'm uh, just trying to remove something which is <laughs> stuck to my leg. Right, okay, I've done with that. Um, the um, Hi-Fi Show Live, there's a show, uh, show report for this on the site. Uh, so I'm not going to talk necessarily about specifics. I just want to try and convey that I think that this is a really good idea. Um, in terms of a location and what's being done and how it's being done. Um, and I suppose there's an element of contention to this as well. This isn't, I say, I've said in the show report itself, this is not a great sounding venue. I would argue, I mean, it's relative. You can probably get a better sound out of a Marriott hotel room in Bristol than you can out of these very glass oriented uh, rooms at the Ascot uh, enclosure. But as far as I'm concerned, that's really rather secondary. What this is, is an extremely pleasant place to walk around. Um, it, it is spacious. It is elegant. It is everything that the Bristol Marriott is not. Um, 
and um, it gives exhibitors uh, space and um, arrangements, which means that the one, they're sonically not on top of each other. There's actually the means to space them out. And um, that means that if people do want to give it the beans, they're not interfering with anybody else. Um, the rooms are airy, well-lit, attractive, um, ideal places to show things in lit by you know natural light you can get a real feel for how they might look and behave in your actual room and i i think it's well worth a visit if you are um you know if you are going to be anywhere near it next year i i thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it it's um it, it's a different way it to me it is closer to a lot of what i see at munich munich is enormously important but again it doesn't sound any good it's a massive collection of glass and concrete it's the most reflective environment you could imagine but nevertheless it's tremendously important because it's an, a very very pleasant and and capable venue for exhibiting lots and lots of equipment including lots and lots of high-end equipment this is the same thing here i thought it was it was well thought out well you know well laid out and it's an excellent venue for this sort of thing what kind um, of support did it get ed from the industry was it mainly dealers or was it no it was manufacturers it? distributors um i would say the nature of um the perhaps the the, the main individual behind it um is paul miller who is the editor of hi-fi news he uh, also oversees uh, an, a, a, another two magazines it's a high-end focus um, there were items that I would describe as affordable there, um, and I'd describe them as affordable with a straight face. But, you, you know, um, Absolute Sounds, very large high-end distributor, and a number of other organisations that contest that sort of space were there in force, and they were there in force with products that have price tags that comfortably wander off into six figures. Um, so, yeah, it's unquestionably high-end, but you then get... Um, uh, organizations, for example, like Henley Audio, the people who look after project monitor audio, things like that. Now, they always have a, a nice, solid booth at the bottom of the Bristol show as well. It's not like they ignore Bristol. It's not like they're going to ignore Bristol this time around. But um, they had one of the large rooms and they were able to bring lots and lots of their things, have a couple of them running and, you know, alternating between them, depending on the time of day. And the result was you just you're just able to see the breadth of what they do and get hands on with a very large selection of equipment. So I, I I'm quite positive about this. And it must be said that the, that the comments from people in the show uh, in the thread who did go as, were, were quite positive as well. So, um, I mean, it's had a tough coming into this world. It, the show first show went in 2019 and then obviously had two years off because of COVID. It was all set to go in 2023 and then obviously the Queen died, sadly. So that had to be cancelled at the last minute. Um, so it's getting itself back together again. I think it warrants being a fixture, this one. I think it's a decent a, a decent venue being used intelligently. So that's my sort of closing statement on it. The items uh, that I thought were of relevance to AV Forums people uh, plus Lowther uh, uh, are in uh, in the show report. And if you've got any specific questions, you can, of course, leave them in the podcast uh, thread and I will see if I took photos of it and had a listen because I did actually miss an entire room because I was hurtling around because I had limits to my childcare time. So that's all my fault. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, upcoming reviews. I'll be brief on this. I have got the um, new but not remotely new Musical Fidelity A1, a complete... Um, revision of uh, reworking of a very early musical fidelity product from the 1980s uh, i've already mentioned hopefully we get the songs famous duettos this month maybe next we'll see how we go also in the not sure if it's this month or next month for different reasons which i can't go into uh the riga Aya, their new floor stander for 1500 pounds made out of a similar but not identical material to the kite loudspeaker that we looked at with the system one and then we've got some more amplifiers uh there's uh, uh the moon 250 we haven't looked at a moon amplifier in ages so we're going to start by looking at one which is a relatively sensible price and if you like what you see there we might have a look at one that's a less sensible price and then hopefully hopefully we will also get one of the new arcam radio a25s uh i've got philips wireless earphones i've got philips earphones that help you sleep um and if things go really well there might be me looking at something from poliston as well so you know it's, it's busy basically um okay. and then i'm going to finish off by uh three standard recommendations which you're free to ignore 
Um, albums, it's been a really weird couple of weeks for new material. There's been lots of it and very little of it has really gelled with me. However, um, a French artist with the rather magnificent name of Captain Mustache uh, came out with the Super Album. That's the name of it. Uh, last Friday. Uh, it's available on all major streaming services and you can buy a download of it on Bandcamp. My like uh, perversions towards French of Electronica are well known. So, you know, take that with the standard warning. Um, it's it, it's French Electronica. I just think it's very nicely done. It riffs on some of the retro things without being overtly retro i think it does some clever items and then if we're talking about retro vinyl uh you'll think i've completely lost my senses um those of you of a senior disposition i'm looking at you ian like me uh may remember the original uh wipeout from oh. playstation uh, playstation one or the playstation as it was known back then i'm delighted to say that um you will be able shortly to buy the remastered soundtrack to the original Wipeout plus two songs from Wipeout 2097 that were not done by known artists. They were done by the guy, the in, in-house guy who under the, under the uh, perf- uh, sort of performance name of Cold Storage. That with remixes and all sorts of other bells and whistles um, is going to a double CD or a three vinyl, uh, three record release uh, in November. And yes, I fully question my sanity wanting to spend £42 plus postage (laughs) on the soundtrack to a computer game, but I am, and I don't care, and I have every suspicion that I'm going to love it and play it more than records that are objectively better. So make, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Uh, We have reached the point where they are selling old computer game soundtracks to us. I mean, actually, this isn't the first of this. There's been other uh, computer game soundtracks put on vinyl, but this is the one that I'm going to buy. Um, And playlist, um, after sending you a playlist full of angry noises last time around, uh, there's a playlist called Lo-Fi Dreaming uh, on Tidal, came out relatively recently, and it is music to help you calm down and go to sleep. Um, and frankly, uh, we could all do with that from time to time. It's maybe not one that you want to listen to on your way to work. Um, it possibly might take the edge off what performance <laughs> you have, but, um, it's, it's a decent, a decent listen for just, just having something on to just calm things down, relax the mood and so on and so forth. That's on Tidal. If any of you are desperate to have it on another streaming service, I, we can pop the link into the thread and you can use the Soundiz, that Sound IIZ app, to port it across to the streaming service that you actually use. And I'm sure that most of it will transfer across for you. Those are my recommendations. Feel free to ignore them. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for the uh, for the hi-fi section, Ed, as always. Um, and that wraps it up for tonight. Um, the Home Cinema Guys will be back next podcast. Uh, Martin's been incredibly busy recently. Um, and as some of you regulars will be aware, Doug had uh, a flooding incident um, with the new house that he had. And uh, that's kind of going to keep him out of action until the new year. So hopefully um, he'll be able to crack on with that and uh, we'll see him again in the new year. Uh, but yeah, the guys should be back for the next podcast, the next Home Cinema podcast uh, area. Right, so uh, just wrapping up tonight then, so the AV Forums podcast, the next one is a movies edition. Um, that's here next week. That's Monday the 16th of October. The guys start at 8.30 if you want to watch live. Um, or of course, as soon as that goes live, it's then available on uh, Catch Up uh, across all your podcast providers and so on. The next main AV Forums podcast, this podcast is back in two weeks on the 23rd of October. And again, we'll be starting at the usual time at 7 p.m. if you want to watch us uh, live on YouTube. Uh, But that's it for this week's show. My thanks to Ian and Ed. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you, sir. And, of course, if you've enjoyed the podcast, then, of course, you can do all the cliched uh, social stuff like subscribe, hit buttons, do ring bells, all that kind of thing. Uh, you know the score. And of course, if you really like the podcast, then you can buy us a coffee. Uh, buymeacoffee.com forward slash AV forums. Of course, if you want to support us on a regular basis, uh, Patreon is the place to do that. And the uh, all the information for that is in the description underneath this video if you're watching on YouTube. Um, right. So uh, that's it for this week. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And we'll see you again soon. Good night.